Welcome to Memo Q Talks, where we talk to industry leaders about their experiences, lessons learned, and what works best across all areas of localization. Now, here's your host. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Memo Q Talks. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Memo Q Talks. Today, we are going to be talking to Mr. David Hensfield who is, according to his LinkedIn bio, a Zen strategist, relationship builder, mentor, lifelong student. He's also the SVP, which I think, or excuse me, EVP, Executive Vice President of Global Sales for DotSub. And we're going to be talking to David about video translation, something that I know absolutely nothing about. Okay, so I'm hoping that this is going to be quite (laughs) educational for me. Uh, Good, I can say anything. Yeah. (laughs) So, uh, but before we start, hey, David, how are you? I'm great. Thanks. How are you, Mark? Thanks for having me. Awesome, on. man. Awesome. I, my days start really early uh, because I'm on the West Coast of the U.S. and I work with MemoQ, which is all the way over in Budapest. Right. And so I've got to get oh. up early to get them at the end of their day. And this is kind of my last official activity of the day. So I'm. Uh, it's kind of a nice way to, to, to wrap up the day. Hey, I've got to ask you, before we get into the topic of um, video translation, what is a Zen strategist? Well, so I'm kind of refining that whole definition, but it's basically kind of the art of listening to your business and listening to the marketplace and kind of bringing that internally into you so that you can, you can, uh, you can express the business through your products and services. Mm -hmm. I think when I, when I have gone through business in the past, everything has been very rushed and we're just rushing to the marketplace with products and we're just doing this and we're doing that. We're not really listening. We're not taking the time to kind of look within, look within the company, look within our products, and then uh, offer to the marketplace what it's asking for. And so that's kind of became a Zen strategist. It's kind of a thing I kind of made up because I feel it's really important to kind of sit, take a break, meditate, listen to what's going on, listen internally to what's going on, and kind of act from that rather than just be reactive to uh, pressures that may or may not be happening. I totally agree with you. And yeah, I mean, sometimes we get so caught up in just to fighting fires and reacting and it's harder to develop kind of a long, longer term strategy, a longer term outlook if you're always just responding to the latest crisis. And sometimes we miss it. Sometimes that is our strategy and it becomes our only strategy is putting out one fire after it's another. It's not very fun. Yes. It feels, and sometimes when you're in the moment, it feels like you're getting stuff done. It's like, oh, you know how busy right. I am. But um, I'm wondering sometimes about the true values of those activity. And, I, and we could probably have a, a whole other conversation about that because that's a, that's a fascinating topic. Yeah. Um, I, I've learned a lot through yoga. I mean, that's been my, been my thing. And so that's awesome, man. I, I try to. I try to translate that into my business as well. Well, the um, the other thing that you said was is listening. Listening is hugely important, and you know uh, you're out there touch, touching bases with customers, uh, with your own team, and um, the ability to listen is incredibly important. So, before we jump into the uh, the uh, topic of video translation, what does the market and and you know for all this listening, what is it telling you right now about your business? Wow, there's lots of things. That's a great question. So it's telling me that globalization is happening at a large scale, faster than we could even anticipate that in our business, video localization is is on the tipping point to explode. Um, It's always been um, kind of taking a backseat, I think, to everything else. And video localization, I think, is now pushing its way through the forefront. Uh, COVID really helped that along as we were all dependent on that for a couple of years there with everything being video. Mm -hmm. Um, And now that even that COVID is over, we see the value of video in so many different aspects of our life that localizing that content has become increasingly important. Awesome. Well, since that's, you know, the topic at hand, maybe you can tell me uh, what is video localization and is that the same thing as video translation? So the tricky thing about video localization is that you only have a you only have a short time to say something. So you don't have a full page to say, you know, any to translate any way you need to. You have a segment that you need to you need to translate in and then once the speaker's done done, it's over mm-hmm. and we have to we have to we have to create that translation to be culturally relevant, to be accurate. 
and to be uh, precise within that speaking segment. And so it's a little bit of a different game than when we talk about text and we have a whole page to work on. Well, and, and when I think of video translation, I think of like subtitles, but is it subtitles right. or is it actually a voiceover? Is it dubbing? What is it? Well, sure, it can be. So we do, yeah, we can be, uh, the, the, the source would always be some sort of transcription. When, when you get a video in and you have to localize it, the first thing you do is you transcribe it in the source language. And that gives you a template. Now, when we create subtitles for that, we need that. That's, that's important to us for timing and accuracy. So we take that, we take that transcription, that caption file, and then from there, we translate that file into the various languages and that can be translated and edited. Now from there, uh, you can create a voiceover from it, whether uh, synthetically or human. Uh, you can also burn in the subtitles into the, uh, into the file as well. Okay. So I, actually my next step was about critical steps and you've kind of just got into that. Um, I, I want to drill down on that, but let me back up a second. Yeah. You know, you mentioned that we're on the cusp of this explosion in video translation um, in terms of the market and, and the, the amount of content that's going to be translated. Where is that coming from? Is that, you know, entertainment, the, the Netflix of the world out there, yeah. or is it uh, learning and development for corporations or, you know, what is it? Yes, to all of the above. <laughs> Yeah, it's absolutely. It's absolutely entertainment going back into their archives, looking at um, uh, movies and TV shows that they think have value throughout the world and wanting to uh, create localization or translation for that so that they can see some ROI on those properties throughout the world. We're seeing that a lot with e-learning and training and large companies who are um, have a you know, global workforce who are finding it more important to localize their content so that their employees uh, and partners have full knowledge of, of uh, what's happening within the videos and within the company that's communicated through the videos. We're seeing a lot of e-learning take place mm -hmm. uh, that's being globalized too. And, and they know that they're, it's not just people here in the States who are, who are signing onto these training videos that they are, uh, valuable in many countries. And so they're localizing in, in mass. And from where you sit, is it the usual su suspects in terms of language pairs, you know, English, Spanish, or is it, what, where are you seeing the demand come from? It is the usual pairs, but we're definitely getting a lot of, uh, a lot of different languages now as well. I mean, it's, it's of course, Spanish, French, German, we're getting a lot of Chinese, Japanese, Korean, uh, Portuguese, obviously. Uh, but then we'll get, we'll get some, you know, that's mainly our core, but we get, we get different languages throughout as well. But, but ba the basic core is, is that, uh, for, for localization. Okay. Special projects, you know, might require some, some, um, more specialized languages we get we get uh we get requests for native american dialects as well that's awesome um what about sign language yeah we do we actually caption from sign language okay yeah we've had several jobs where it's just the signer on the screen and we're captioning and translating from that as well awesome let's get back into yeah. the workflow again um because I, again I've, sure. I've never managed any video translation or video localization projects. Yeah. And it just seems like this black box uh, to me. So I, I really kind of want to dig into it. I think you mentioned the first step was to transcribe the video into the source language so that the translators, if you're going into one language or multiple languages, at least the translator or translators have the source content to deal with because they don't want to listen right. and translate. They want to look at the text or, or yeah. they'll want to use some type of tool um, you know, some type of, uh, cat tool, et cetera, that they can have that there. Um, now, do you still, do you leverage when you do that? <clears throat> are there some specific skills that transcribers use? Or are you using, uh, are automated tools now? How does that happen? Yeah. Transcribers have to be able to time the content. So definitely they have to be able to work with the software specifically and be able to know how to time the content and a good transcriber or translator who's working on 
subtitles will probably know how to, will probably have some tricks in their bag on how to shorten sentences and how to get meanings across in different ways in order to be able to express themselves in that small amount of time. So they're not doing a, they're not doing a word for word transcription. They're just, they're getting the meaning down for the source language. So if they're, no, they're trying, correct. Yes and no. I mean, they're trying to do as much as they can for a word to word translation. Obviously they want it to be as accurate as possible, but timing is a very important aspect of the translation. So yeah, it may be, it may look different on video than it would if it were just text. Okay. And so is there, a, is there a tool then that they use so that when they're transcribing, not translating right now, but just transcribing the source text that they can, um, match up the timing of the text with the timing of the video? Yeah, there are several tools actually that are available on our platform dot sub. We have our own tool and it's kind of laid out for them. And so they can just start from zero and they can start transcribing it then. And they can, they can time it out. Uh, they can create transcription. They can create the time transcriptions. And then if they want to just have the text later so they can put that through a cat tool, they can just download it without the, without the markings. Awesome. And then what about automated tools? Uh, you know, what are you seeing in terms of, cause I, I use a tool, uh, for some of my podcasts where I, I want to get the transcript it will just create the transcript. And I'll have to go through and clean it up. For example, they're, yeah. they're getting better. And one of the things I had have a bad habit, always going, um, 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 a lot. And you can go through and automatically <laughs> remove all those, um, which makes me sound better. It makes me sound like I know what I'm they doing. would do it for you, right? <laughs> That's a pretty common situation. Yeah. So are, are you, are you seeing the use of these kind of tools more often now? Yeah, of okay. course. I mean, that's just part and parcel of what's going on with our, with our world right now. I will tell you that, it's difficult for AI not, not to pick up the words, but to pick up segmentation. So that's the biggest struggle right now is that it won't, especially when something needs to be translated, to have it run through the machine and have it segmented correctly so that it can then be translated correctly is very tricky. Okay. And so that's the, the one thing we're, we're working on. So you on. probably do need some type of human in the loop to go through, even if you really do need a human in the loop for post edit. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I would know it would be hard to feed something that's, uh, that's, um, awesome automated speech recognition file into translation directly into machine translation directly, especially because you would, you would have a mess. Yeah. It would be a jumble of words. So, okay. You get you have the transcript, and now you're going to get, send it out to the translator or multiple translators, depending on how many different language pairs and, and so on. Yep. Um, and then to, at, from that point, are they using a traditional TMS, or are they using a tool that's very bespoke to uh, this t this type of workflow? Yeah, like I said, when when we set it out, they use they they continue to use our tool at DotSub, but. Uh, they, you know, there are several tools available for them, whether it be uh, a SaaS solution like we have or offline tools uh, that are actually hardware that they're downloaded into their, into their computers. They can, they can use a variety of different things in order to, to caption the work. Okay. And they can run things through a dedicated TM. Um, if they think there's a good match, they can use that. They can modify yep. it if necessary. So from that point, it's, it's. Once you get it, the source text transcribed, uh, then it becomes more of a traditional workflow, but you still have to pay attention to that timing and I guess sentence length. Yeah, well, you're still timing. You're still, you're still creating captions yeah. at the end of the day. I mean, you're creating these captions that need to be timed. So if I'm going to put something through a cat tool, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the block of text. I'm going to put it through the tool. I'm going to get that block of text back with all the matches. And then I'm still going to have to have a linguist go through and then match each sentence to, to the specific timing. Okay. And that's when we have the subtitles or captions. Mm -hmm. uh, Correct. But then if you want to actually have a voiceover and mm -hmm. synthetic voiceover, we keep, we just extract the, the, um, the voice track and then we okay. use the subtitles gotcha. and as, as the base for the voiceover and we, the synthetic voiceover reads the subtitles and then it's put back into the, the video as a burden. Okay. So you have an option. Once you have that, um, again, I'm sorry, I'm being yeah, very no basic worries. here, but it's my first time through this, you know, uh, 
you have the transcribed source text, you send it out for translation, you get the translation yep. back. Now you have some options. Uh, you can just do subtitles or you could send it out to a professional voice Correct. talent, voiceover artist or voice yep. artist. Um, I'm sure I'm getting that no, wrong and fine. I'm going to get hate mail for that. You can say voiceover <laughs> voice. But, and then you, they don't, nobody knows how to spell voiceover, whether you should do a dash in between or two words or one word. It's very confusing. Right. Um, and or you have AI uh, options with synth synthetic voice over Correct. services. And, and what are you seeing now in terms of, uh, of that? I mean, obviously, you're going to spend more for, for a professional voice over artist um, compared to, I would think you would be spending more than compared to, say, a synthetic voiceover. Um, you know, but what, what are you seeing? What, which domains are using which tools? So we're seeing a lot of requests from e-learning for synthetic voice um, mm -hmm. because they have a lot of video and to actually do it all by human right. would be not very cost effective. It would cost a lot of money. So we're seeing a lot in e-learning for that. For marketing, we're still seeing a lot of human, actually voiceover, entertainment, obviously still human voiceover. Um, and so, but I think there's a huge segment that doesn't want to spend a couple hundred dollars for a two minute video on a human voiceover. They want to spend a few dollars, get the synthetic voiceover. It, <laughs> it, these sounds, the, the, the new sounds are, I mean, you can sort of tell they're computer animated and some of, some of them are better some languages are better than others, but on the whole for the cost savings, it's, I think a great deal. It's worth it. Well, how, how far out are we from, machine learning, listening to this conversation, and then a, you know, a synthetic machine, David Hansfield and Mark Schreiner, God forbid, uh, <laughs> do the next years. podcast and, and we can just sit off the sidelines and they, and, you know, and, and, and they emulate our voices. How, how far out are I mean, we from I, that? I think we're not that far from that. I think they're already, I mean, we saw programs where you can manipulate the mouth and where you can actually create a human Wow, we saw it, it was at the Gala conference last week and they had Morgan Freeman on, but it wasn't Morgan Freeman. It was an AI version of Morgan Freeman. And it's just amazing. I wonder, does he get a royalty for that? He must get a royalty so. for that. Wouldn't would that be cool? <laughs> you know, so the things that they're doing yeah. now that are in place now are pretty amazing. And I don't think it'll be too much longer, a few years at most before, before that happens. So what's the price delta? I think you, earlier you said like two hundred dollars an hour or for a two minute yeah, video pay, versus two dollars. Is that the is that the price? Yeah, delta I mean we charge on a video minute for synthetic voiceover a few dollars per video minute for synthetic voiceover to a session fee for a human of being a uh, starting at two hundred and fifty dollars. So are the voiceover talents around the world up in arms going, oh my God, the machines are going to replace us? Because that's kind of like the general discussion. You know, you started with machine translation and translators, yeah, sure. and chat, chat GBT and journalists, and everybody's worried about AI taking away their jobs. Um, at the same time, you know, you just said you're busier yeah. than ever because there's just an explosion. Well, you know content, what? The right? opportunity for the voice artists is that we can customize a voice based upon their voice. So you can actually mm. take their voice... You can record sentences from the them and then create a whole database of their voice and use their voice synthetically. As long as they get I a mean, royalty yeah, or something. They'll get a royalty. <laughs> that could be the future for a human voiceover. It's fascinating. Yeah. And I just wonder how good it's going to get because uh, a huge part of most languages and some more than others is the, obviously the pronunciation, but the intonation. Right. And the intonation oftentimes conveys a lot of meaning, cultural right? relevance. So is really important. Cultural yeah. relevance, yeah, yeah. Yep. Again, you have so, to you have to understand the goals for the project that you're 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 working on, and at some point, we have a quality spectrum of lousy to excellent. And you know, does every project need to be on the excellent spectrum, or can there be some in the mm -hmm. gray area, depending on the scale of the project and your needs and the audience and what their expectations are for. Well, most of mine are in the gray area. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank goodness for some, some my, my employers saying it's okay to be in the gray area. <laughs> Just get it out there. But uh, 
Well, um, and that's true. Because I'm, trying best, I'm trying my best. Try my best. Because a lot of times, I mean, people don't have a budget for the the Rolls Royce at the end of the spectrum, the quality yeah. spectrum. So, what what are some of the obviously Dot Sub have you guys have your right. own tool? Uh, what are some of the other relevant tools in this space and the must have integrations? Oh, we work a lot with online video players, so Kaltura. Brightco, JW Player, YouTube, Vimeo. Those are awesome integrations. And those are those are online video platforms that are really helpful uh, for people who are making a lot of videos, for companies who are making a lot of videos and need a need a place to store them and need a place, need a method of transport for those videos. So give me a use case of how that integration would work. So we have, for example, Brightcove is a really popular platform. Uh, people who are Brightcove customers can integrate right with our platform and and a uh, agnostic. I mean, they can a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of people in this area have the same integration, um, where Brightcove integrates with Dotsub and the videos move seamlessly in between the two platforms. The orders work seamlessly in between the two platforms. And then when the work is done, instead of me sending back a file manually, I send back a file and it's paired up directly with the, with the video. So there's no, gotcha. there's no, nobody has to leave a platform to go to another platform to, to order something and do the work. It's all done within one. And what about customers who have a preference for their TMS or translation management system or their CAT tool? Are you able to, to integrate yeah, with that's, them? Yeah, that's the sticking point right now is we are not at this moment. So we do work with folks who do that. They just take the work offline, they feed it through the CAT tool, and then they send it back to us and we provide the timings. Awesome. Um, so... What are your customers? What are their biggest concerns when you go to meet with them? Okay, and I'm gonna I'm talk about a couple different kind of customers. Let's just say, hey man, I've got I'm, I'm a I'm a Netflix type sure. customer, and I've got all these. I got this series that I've got to get uh, translated and uh, including the voiceovers done. What are they worried about? Obviously, the quality, the turnaround times. I mean, how does the conversation yeah, unfold? Those, what, what typically is typically a customer like that will probably not have one specific place to go in order to get everything done. So somebody wants to have some sort of an organized approach. Uh, that's the, the, when I started in this business a few years ago, everybody was sending files all over the place and there wasn't one place they could go. Now they have several options where they can kind of condense it into a platform and then work from that platform. So that's the first thing is organization. Second thing is uh, quality. You know, can I get this done? Uh, can I get this done uh, with, with good quality? Are people going to complain about it? Am I going to, you know, are we going to be culturally, um, are we going to be culturally relevant with the translations, but are they going to be accurate? Are we going to offend people? You know, what are we going to do and how is this going to be also compliant to whatever regulations we might be put in place? Uh, thirdly, do they, do, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, go for it. 30 days rates. rates. Yeah, I mean, rates are probably number yeah, yeah. one, to be honest. But but before they even get to rates, they have to think of those two things first. They have to think, how am I going to get this project done? How is it going to be organized? What's it going to look like? And then how much am I going to have to pay for it? What if I have my favorite um, voice over artists and I want you or another provider to use them, but I want to use your tool? Is that an option? Um. Well, we don't have, yeah, I mean, we don't, we'll, we'll take anybody's uh, MP3 so you can, you can use your, your favorite artist and deliver that to us and we'll add it to the video for sure. Okay, so you would do the, the transcription, uh, then the translation, or we'd have a translator no. and then the voiceover artist would send back the Correct. MP3. Yep. Okay. And then in terms of that, that, that recording component of it, do are there specialty, I mean, do you guys do that as well, where you have um, a recording platform and that we're, so and, yeah, and we how does that work? I'm working remotely. Like I'm, I'm recording in my living room right now, which is probably not the best acoustics in the world, but I don't have a choice because my wife kicked me out of well, my I office, right? Because so, totally she's working yeah. from home. So, hey, you know. <laughs> we have a recording partner in the UK who does our work for us and it's an actual studio. 
and okay. the town okay. comes in and records in a studio. So there's nobody sitting with an iPhone and doing that or anything like that, unless it's a very remote place. We've had some we've had some remote work in Africa done where it was clearly uh, not done in a studio, and uh, we weren't even mm -hmm. able to use the voiceover. But they, to be honest, they did the best job they actually could with the circumstances that they had. Is there, I mean, I know in the local industry, we have, you know, the, the local worlds, the galas, the ALCs, the ATAs, and vamos juntos. Yeah, it's happening now, isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> and others. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering for your niche or for the, 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 the video translation localization niche, is there a specialty event? Uh, you know, there's a CMA event, which is Corporate Media Managers. I've been to that several times. That's really interesting. That's a bunch of, uh, you know, video folks from uh, enterprise companies, uh, large, large companies. Uh, there's NAB, National Association of Broadcasters, uh, that happens in Vegas. It's happening next month. Um, and then there's specialty events. I, we, you typically hit the localization events. So a shift okay. from when I started was our customer used to be uh, the, guy, the, the people in the video departments, and now our customer is localization agencies. Right. So it's so changed. Somebody reaches out yeah, to we've them. Become, we've gone yeah. from being a video tool to a localization tool. And it's been, an, it's been interesting to see that shift because the expectations of the person in video is a lot different than the expectations of the person in localization. It, well, explain well, that. it's a lot higher in localization. So now that video is being as is, is kind of I said kind of pushing itself to the forefront. Now the localization department at uh, these big companies we work with are paying more attention to the quality of the, the the translations, the timings, everything is being scrutinized a lot more than when I started, and it was just an afterthought. Hey, the video person needs to add French and Spanish to this. Go, go get these so we can send this video out. So, does most of your business then come through those kind of partners from from LSPs who say, "Hey, you know, we we have a customer. They want to do right. video. We don't really do it right. exactly hands on, so we need right. a partner." So that's where you're getting. Yeah. Most then our of your platform is very flexible, so that even like an end user, a client who has LSPs, can all hop on the platform. And they can do all the work there themselves. And so we have clients that may have one to two LSPs on the platform all working on videos at once. Awesome. Okay, just a couple more questions. Imagine I'm an LSP <clears throat> and, you know, I'd like to handle some video inquiries, but I don't want to sound like an idiot. What are the, like, the three questions that I should ask? If I have a, a you know, inquiry about uh, video translation services, Obviously, I need to ask the, the end customer some questions to understand about the project. And then so I can kind of work with you or another agency to work up a quote. What are the, what, what are the two, three, sure. four most important questions I should First be asking? First of all, we need to know what type of content you're dealing with. You want to make mm -hmm. sure you have the proper translators uh, for the proper contents. Secondly, you want to know how many videos you have. And if you can get a, if you can get a runtime of the amount of video minutes you have, uh, in video, we charge per video minute. We don't charge per word. So it's a little different of a pricing model. So we need to know how many video minutes you have. Obviously, you need to know what languages, what the source language is. That's really important. And then what the uh, target languages are. And then I always like to find out who the final audience is. Is this going to be streamed? Is this going to be for entertainment? Is this going to be broadcast lives? I mean, how is this going to be? How is this going to be viewed and by whom? Yeah. How about uh, file formats? Is that? Yeah, we take all? most any file format. I mean, the most common one is MP4, but we're able to, we're able, I mean, most, most players are able to absorb anything. Awesome. Okay. So uh, is there an industry guide or resource if, if I wanted to learn more about video translation and localization, where would I go? I, I would just Google it. I would go to chat GPT. Okay. <laughs> Actually, that, that that's another question. Um, it, does chat GPT, has that affected your 
workflows nope, at all? Not yet, but I mean, it's so brand new. Right. It, look, we just got onto four, uh, but it's definitely something we're looking at, um, trying to figure out how we can incorporate that into, into the mix for sure. It's really awesome. interesting. It is definitely, um, on all it's affecting all aspects of life. I just got a, a message from one of my son's teachers that, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> Because there's tools to check whether you're using right. ChatGPT. And uh, he knew about ChatGPT, but he didn't know about the ChatGPT detection tools. So <laughs> now he knows. <laughs> I'll be honest. I had an email the other day and I had to run it. I didn't like how it looked. And I ran it through ChatGPT and it gave me a much better format for it. I, I use that. Oh, one. it's so good. Really good. I, I, what's funny is you can play around with the styles too. I was like, you know, sending an email to my wife, but I wanted it to be in Shakespearean English yeah. and uh, did it. Yeah. <laughs> she doth teach the torches to burn bright. Um, anyway, hey, David, I, I've enjoyed this conversation, uh, this tutorial on video localization and translation. And uh, I'm pretty sure I'll see you at uh, an event Absolutely. this fall, this summer, spring, summer, or fall, uh, as usual. And uh, thank you so much for coming on. Thank Memory you very Talks, much guys. for having me, Mark. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for joining Memo Q Talks, where we talked with industry leaders about their experiences and lessons learned to gain new insights about what works best across all areas of localization. Join us next time on Memo Q Talks.